And welcome to today's hearing, Investing in America's Tourism and Hospitality Workforce and Small Businesses. Today, we'll examine the state of the tourism and hospitality workforce in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the experiences and challenges of the tourism and hospitality-related small businesses and those businesses outside the industry who nonetheless depend on travel and tourism to bring them customers. We'll also review regional impacts of the pandemic on communities that rely on tourism and hospitality workforce and receive insight on how Congress can support workers and small businesses as the travel and tourism industry recovers. The U.S. hotel and hospitality industry continues to experience severe pandemic-related impacts, and consequently, so do the workers in that industry. For Nevada, this is almost 25% of our workforce. Prior to the pandemic in 2019, Nevada's job market exhibited signs of strength with a seasonally adjusted unemployment rate of around 3% and just over 1% unemployment rate among workers covered by unemployment insurance. However, by mid-March of 2020, as the world began seeing the impacts of the public health crisis, the situation started to change dramatically. Our seasonally adjusted unemployment rate rose to over 6%, followed by a steep and unprecedented increase to 30% in April of 2020, the highest unemployment rate in the nation, I may add. So for two weeks in March, initial unemployment claims increased from just over 6,000 to over 92,000 claims. This significant rise in unemployment in Nevada in part reflects our state's reliance on leisure and hospitality employment in the state economy. Tourism drives most of the demand in the hospitality industry and COVID-19 decimated tourism. At the onset of the crisis, Nevada's leisure and hospitality sector was the largest contributor to wage and salary employment. In February 2020, the, le 2020, excuse me, the leisure and hospitality sector employed over 356,000 workers in a state with an overall population of just a little over 3 million. Taken together, this data suggests that workers in leisure and hospitality have probably borne the brunt of unemployment in Nevada. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics nationwide, leisure and hospitality lost 2.8 million jobs during the pandemic that have yet to return. This represents more than 25% of all unemployed persons in the United States. The 99% of businesses in Nevada that are small businesses have also struggled, particularly minority-owned small businesses who are far too often disproportionately impacted in economic slowdowns and left behind in economic recoveries. I've made support for workers and small businesses one of my top priorities during the pandemic, and I call on my colleagues here today to not lose sight of the fact that this has been an uneven recovery, one in which small businesses and workers in the hardest hit states will continue to need our help until we are fully past the pandemic. We will build back better, but it's gonna take time and it's gonna take investment. While many industries in Nevada are starting to come back, statewide, the leisure and hospitality industry is only at 70% of its pre-COVID peak employment levels. That's down more than 106,000 jobs. The strong and robust presence of organized labor in Nevada directly aids the recovery for workers. Compared to other states in the Mountain West, Nevada has maintained a relatively higher rate of unionization in recent years, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In 2019, more than 14% of employed workers in Nevada belong to unions, which is an increase of 2.5 percentage points over 2016 levels. And it's much higher than the nationwide figure of just over 10%. Unions in Nevada help to improve quality of employment relationships and working conditions. You know, as a college student coming home for the summer, I was a member of Nevada's Culin uh, Culinary Workers Union Local 226 when I waited tables at Caesars Palace. And I'm grateful for that job that helped me pay for my college tuition. And you know, the Culinary Workers Union is the largest private sector union in Nevada. It represents approximately 60,000 workers and organizes the main casino and hotel properties on the Las Vegas Strip and downtown, represents housekeepers, bartenders, bellmen, many others. 
The Culinary Workers Union has been a lifeline for the hospitality workforce in Nevada. And in fact, the very last meet in-person meeting I took in Capitol Hill before we closed our offices in March due to the pandemic was with Mr. D. Taylor, president of Unite here. Uh, the union with which Nevada's Culinary 226 is proudly affiliated. So I am pleased to have him here today testifying as an expert witness. Uh, Mr. Taylor and Unite Here have gone above and beyond during the pandemic to support the workers they represent, even running their own food bank when the local economy was in the most dire situation. In the early months of the pandemic, when 98% of the more than 300,000 Unite Here workers were out of work, Mr. Taylor and the union stood by their members, and I look forward to his testimony here today about how we get tourism and hospitality moving again. Also testifying virtually today to share their expertise, insight, and recommendations, we have Nevada's own Shondell Newsom, chair of the Las Vegas Urban Chamber of Commerce, which works to provide access to local, national, and global markets for small and diverse businesses in Southern Nevada. In addition, we're pleased to have representatives with us from the following organizations, of course, virtually. It's the Florida Attractions Association, which promotes and advances the interests of businesses in the attraction industry and World Travel Holdings, a leisure company. It's my hope that today's hearing will help us better understand the challenges that small businesses and the hospitality workforce that the challenges that they face as a result of depressed business and leisure travel caused by the pandemic, and that today's hearing will provide a forum for an engaging discussion on how to support workers and small businesses as they recover. Thank you all again for being here today. I look forward to hearing each of you share your experiences and expertise, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ranking Member Scott for his opening statement, and then we'll introduce our uh, witnesses. Senator Scott. I want to thank Chair Rosen for hosting this uh, uh, hearing today. I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, for being with us and sharing your perspectives. There's a lot that um, the state of Nevada, especially Las Vegas, has in common with the state of Florida. We're very much dependent on our tourism industry, and I know we have four wonderful witnesses today that are going to talk about the impact it has had on our small businesses. I want to thank um, Bill Luper and uh, Drew Daly for testifying today and sharing their insights from Florida small businesses and their employees. Florida, like Las Vegas, is a global travel destination. People from all over the world come to enjoy our beaches, our attractions, and all our state has to offer. When I was governor, we worked hard to grow our tourism industry, and we actually were able to grow it from about 80 million tourists a year uh, by the time I left to 126 million tourists, a record each of those years. I know this pandemic has impacted each of us differently and all of our small businesses differently. We've had to adapt to make sure our families, our businesses, and our employees stay safe. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely hurt Florida's travel and tourism industries, which comes with a chain of economic impacts on our restaurants, our small businesses, and our families. And I know Chair Rosen has seen the same thing in Las Vegas and Nevada. I'm glad to see that Florida has, is open for business again, uh, but in order for our state and our nation to fully reopen and get our economy back on track, we have to continue to work together. I've uh, been hearing from many of our small businesses in Florida that are struggling to find workers to fill their open jobs because they're competing with enhanced federal unemployment benefits. I have supported targeted aid for struggling families and businesses, but I've been clear that the federal government should not be paying Americans more to stay home than go back to work. I'm glad to see governors across the nation are taking action uh, to get their assistance back to work. I also want to build with several of my colleagues to phase out this distance aim to work. I'll always work to support our small businesses, get Americans back to work, and get our economy fully open. But we also always have to make sure we help uh, those that's, that still need uh, our help. I've also been very focused on getting the safe and resumption of our cruise line operations, uh, something that hopefully a lot of people from Las Vegas enjoy, but we don't see many cruises from Las Vegas. Uh, so many of our businesses and, and workers that rely on the cruise industry have been left at a standstill for over a year now waiting for the CDC guidance. Uh, while so many industries have reopened, you can go to a restaurant, you can go to an amusement park, you can go stay in a hotel, but the CDC has made it very difficult for a cruise industry to get started again. I'm glad the CDC has finally answered uh, my call and the call of many of my colleagues to get things moving in the right direction so our cruise industry can get back uh, to work. Uh, but the CDC unfortunately has treated our cruise industry terribly over the past year and I'm gonna continue my fight and work with the CDC to make sure 
we reach a quick and, and equitable solution that keeps people safe, um, that want to cruise, the employees safe, um, but also protects the jobs in Florida. And I know there's jobs in Las Vegas tied to the cruise industry and all across our nation. As our nation works to recover from the coronavirus and get our economy back on track, I remain committed to doing everything I can to support our travel industry in Florida and across the United States. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses. I want to thank, again, thank Chair Rosen uh, for organizing this hearing and in inviting the witnesses she's invited. And, and all of us want to understand how the COVID-19 has impacted uh, our industries and how we can help them succeed. So thank you. And thanks again, Chair Rosen. Thank you, and you can cruise on Lake Tahoe and Lake Mead. It's That's not right. the same as the Caribbean cruise, but uh, Actually, you, you can have a nice dinner cruise on both of those. So thank you, uh, Senator Scott. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first witness who is testifying with us remotely today, Dee Taylor. He's the international president of Unite Here. With over 40 years in the labor experience in the labor movement, Mr. Taylor has successfully organized labor negotiations throughout the country and has helped grow the culinary union in Nevada to its current membership level of nearly uh, approximately 60,000 members. Nationally, Unite Here currently represents over 300,000 active union members who work in various roles in the hospitality industry. Uh, hotels, food service, laundry, warehouses, and casinos. Mr. Taylor, you are now recognized for your opening remarks. Uh, first, I, I wanna thank you, uh, Senator Rosen and Senator Scott. It's a real honor and privilege to actually speak in front of y'all. Uh, hopefully this will be the last remote hearing that I have to be involved with because I'm sure like everybody else, we're really tired of Zoom. Um, so, we represent uh, over 300,000 members throughout the United States and Canada. At the beginning of the pandemic, 98% of our workers were laid off. And even today, 50 to 60% are still not working. First in the gaming industry, uh, employment has increased more in the gaming industry, but still uh, it's far behind than what it was before the pandemic. In Atlantic City, we have about 75% of our members back. In Ohio, about 75. Detroit, about 65. Mississippi, about 65. Uh, Las Vegas, a little over 50%. And New Orleans, 32%. And some of the reasons why uh, our workers are not back is because uh, casinos have moved to uh, eliminate a fair amount of food and beverage jobs uh, and also changes in housekeeping. Uh, in food service, uh, the employment there, for example, airline catering, we have about 70% of our workers back, but that's really been paid through the CARES Act funding. In traditional cafeterias, only about 55%. In airport concessions, when people come through, only about 45%. And in stadiums and arenas, less than 40%. And in big convention centers, 5% or less. And there's real concern there about when those jobs will come back because uh, that involves both large and small employers. And in hotel employment, there's really a bifurcation. Uh, in those, some of those leisure markets like Florida, Arizona, and Hawaii, we're starting to return back to pre-COVID levels, but not where it was. But in those markets that have been heavily relying on business, group, international travel, those numbers are so far below what it was before the pandemic. It has affected the ability of people to come back to work. Now, we have a concern too, in the last two downturns after 9-11 and the Great Recession, um, some of those temporary job reductions became permanent. And in fact, between 2001 and 2019, Hotel industry employment by room count decreased by 20%. Uh, and we have issues which we have found to be perplexing. In many cases, we have heard about the inability to get people uh, to come back to work. And at the same time, I think some of that has been caused by the inability of companies to say, you have the right to be recalled. And as we all know, older workers that are terminated, uh, one in 10 will earn much less than what they earned previously. 
And so on one hand, we have uh, a cry for workers. On the other hand, just the basic idea of somebody who's been with the company 20 or 30 years has to start off as a new hire somewhere. You can understand that quandary. And in fact, here in Las Vegas, we had that problem where station casinos uh, fired 7,000 workers. So they have to start all over again, even if you've been with the company 20 or 30 years. Subcontracting, United Airlines got an enormous amount of money from the payroll support program, $7.7 .7 billion actually from the government. And now they're looking to subcontract out all their kitchens with no guarantee of work or benefits. And service cuts. Many hotel owners have been extremely aggressive about this. Like for example, to end daily room cleaning. And so for example, the CEO of Park Hotels, the biggest private sector owner, owner of Hilton's have said, they want to have a permanent reduction of full-time hotel level staffing. So on one hand, we have companies that have really done the right thing. And I, I want to point out one from Florida and one from Nevada. In Florida, Disney, for example, has done tremendous work. They extended health care benefits for all their employees throughout this pandemic and loaded up all the unemployed people into the Florida system, which as everybody knows had some serious issues. And in Nevada, the Wynn Resorts stepped up completely on continuing to pay people and also extend benefits. So we're worried about the future. And at the same time, uh, we think there's a lot that needs to be done to get back on our feet, both with companies and workers. Thank you so much, Senator Rosen and Scott. Microphone on. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for your insights uh, into the hospitality uh, workforce and into our states and important cities. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Senator Scott to introduce our next witness. Senator Scott. CEO of Florida Attractions. He represents over 120 theme parks and tourist attractions in Florida. He's, uh, I had the pleasure to work with Bill when I was uh, governor. Uh, he, he, uh, he and a lot of others, they bring a lot of visitors to our state. So uh, welcome, Bill, and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Rosen and Ranking Member Scott and members of the subcommittee. I want to thank you for your leadership in addressing the pandemic's devastating economic damage, specifically to the nation's hardest hit sector, travel and tourism. I'm honored to participate in this hearing investigating America's tourism and hospitality workforce and small business. Founded in 1949, the Florida Attractions Association, or the other FAA, is Florida's trade association representing the tourist attraction industry. Florida's heritage as a vacation land has evolved through the decades. As our state's natural wonders continue to attract visitors from around the world, our state's man-made attractions have evolved from kitschy roadside attractions to now include the world's most popular theme park destinations. Today, the FAA is comprised of over 250 member businesses. The state's largest attractions are members. However, most of our members are small business. Only 10% of our members are publicly traded companies. Many of our members represent third and fourth generation owner operators of their families' attractions and 40% of our members have annual paid attendance of under 100,000 guests. Florida's non-essential businesses, including our attractions, closed around March 15th of last year. During this time, the actions of Congress to provide support and relief to small business was a great help. The CARES Act, the Pay Paycheck Protection Program, and SBA's economic injury disaster loans were the bridge needed to maintain an employee base and cover ongoing expenses through the closure. Governor DeSantis began the process of reopening Florida's businesses and a pathway to reopen Florida's tourism economy, including attractions, by an executive order on May 18th, 2020. The Florida Attractions Association worked with our members and their respective county governments to define best practices in a tourist attraction environment to provide protection for guests and employees from viral transmission. The objective was clear and the goal unmistakable, reopening safe, smart, and step-by-step. As the industry began to reopen, there was initially a trepid response from travelers needing assurance that their safety was paramount to our industry. As the summer of 2020 progressed, Florida experienced a staycation season as Floridians traveled to other Florida destinations, often within a day's drive of their homes. 
Outdoor facilities were particularly popular. National parks, state parks, outdoor attractions, such as zoos and gardens had the benefit of providing guests fresh air and sunshine. Over the last year, the general pattern has developed as the public's trust in travel returns, confidence in safety protocols proven, and the desire to get out and go inspired Americans to travel once again. Florida has seen increasing return of the domestic traveler, and while it's not at pre-COVID levels, it is encouraging to see attractions, hotels, campgrounds, and restaurants begin to experience recovery. Our state's tourism marketing office, Visit Florida, reported a 14% decline in travel in Florida in the first quarter of 21 compared to 2020. What we need, number one, clear policy coordination between agencies such as the CDC, Department of Transportation, OSHA, and other public facing agencies with timely guidance on defeating the pandemic. Recent changes in the CDC's guidance were a welcome development to our members. However, the swiftness of the changes left many businesses scrambling to interpret the new guidance and assess the impact on their businesses. Even today, guidance from the CDC, Department of Transportation, and OSHA could be viewed as being conflicting. Number two, Florida and much of the nation is experiencing labor shortage and it's acute in Florida's hospitality industry. We know that many of our members are experiencing, experiencing this in part because of the continued payment of state unemployment insurance benefits and federal unemployment relief programs. Governor DeSantis has directed the state to discontinue waiving the work search requirement at the end of this month and Florida will, stop, will step out of the Florida uh, the federal pandemic unemployment compensation program at the end of next month. Entry level labor shortages that are not new. In 19, by 2029, only 28% of teens will participate in the U.S. labor force, down 43% from 1978. The shortage is driving up wages, supply and demand, business must adapt as they compete for talent. But one amusement park has discovered that even wages aren't the answer. This year offering a 100% increase from $10 to $20 per hour and still having to reduce operating hours and close due to labor shortages. And number three, as discussed in your last hearing, the cruise industry, an industry I have no direct professional role in, is still waiting for clear guidance from the CDC. The cruise industry and the attractions industry are fierce competitors, but we need each other to achieve our individual and collective business objectives. Addressing these issues, along with your support of Brand USA, will help us move our tourism economy forward, prepared for a post-pandemic success. Thank you for your leadership in supporting America's hospitality workers and small business. And I look forward to working with you and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lupfer. Testifying next is Sean Dal Newsom, Chairman of the Las Vegas Urban Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Newsom is a 10-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force and a small business owner for the past 15 years. Through both his personal work and the Urban Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Newsom connects small business owners with the resources and access they need to both regional and global markets. Mr. Newsom, you are recognized for your opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Subcommittee. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Shondell Newsom, a Nevada small business owner and founder of Some New Marketing, a firm in partnership with my wife Arlene and my daughter Tiara. In 2015, we were recognized as SBA Nevada Family Owned Bits Business of the Year. Currently, I chair the Las Vegas Urban Chamber of Commerce, co chair Small Business for America's Future serve as a trustee for the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce and co-chair for the Henderson Chambers Issues Committee. So I'm extremely engaged and involved in my small and minority business community. Today, I'm here to speak directly to investing in America's tourism and hospitality workforce and small business. And I wanna thank Senator Rosen, a true small business champion for this opportunity to address you. After serving a decade in the military, I worked for a gaming and hospitality family owned small business station casinos in Nevada as a marketing director. This is where I connected the dots between workforce and small businesses. Not only did we hire thousands of employees with growth, but our local small businesses also benefited from our needs to procure products and services. We purchased balloons, t shirts, signage, and many products and services from local small business vendors. The Las Vegas Strip casinos produce many jobs and procurement opportunities for small businesses. But 
I know that many of you outside of Nevada may not realize that there are small casino operators like Henderson's, Rainbow, and Emerald Island with my friend Tim Brooks as the owner and Poker Palace owned by Mickey and Lori Coleman, Laura Coleman in North Las Vegas. They have served the community since even before I arrived in 1987 to Nellis Air Force Base. Yes, I know these small business owners personally. Despite being the entertainment capital of the world and a global destination, Las Vegas and in particular Southern Nevada is a small, tight community. When one business in a tight community feels a burden, we all feel a burden. The impact of a decrease in business and leisure travel is felt from our major corporations to the smallest Main Street companies. Contracts for my company and many others were either delayed or canceled immediately, causing instant closures and much uncertainty. Small business owners had to reach into our bag of innovative tricks to survive. School and daycare closures put our employees in a bad position. Once we were clear to open again with social distancing, our firm decided to create office space for children to, to attend school remotely giving their parents comfort and peace of mind. The new normal meant that we had to be flexible with team members working remotely with alternating days in the office to keep everyone safe. We followed the science and survived with no major concerns. Investing in America's tourism and hospitality workforce and small business is a safe bet, pun intended, for this country. I implore this committee to double down on the recent successful American Rescue Plan by investing in America's tourism and hospitality workforce and small business to rebuild our economy. In addition, we should all push all of our chips to the middle of the table on the American Jobs Plan to rebuild our infrastructure and create necessary jobs for individuals and contracts for small businesses. The American, the, thank you very much for realizing the importance of the, the tourism, travel, and hospitality industry and small business. We are all winners when we invest wisely this way. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Newsom, for your remarks on tourism and small business, the nexus between the two. So, Senator Scott, I'm going to turn it over you, to you to introduce our fourth and final witness, please. Thank you, Chair Rosen. Um, Drew Daly, Senior Vice President of Dream Vacations World Travel Holdings, is here today to represent and represents World Travel Holdings. Uh, he began working for, uh, for the company as a travel agent. Now he runs their Dream Vacations Cruise One and Cruise Inc. divisions. He also serves on the STAR Board, which is the steering committee for the Cruise Lines International Association. Uh, welcome, Drew. Thank you, Senator Scott, Chairwoman Rosen, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your efforts to bring attention to the devastating economic impact suffered by the countless travel and tourism industry workers and small businesses across the U.S. due to the pandemic. It's a true honor and privilege to represent World Travel Holdings, Dream Vacations, Travel Advisors, and the broader travel advisor community across the United States. Travel agents do in fact exist, and over the years, they have evolved into travel advisors. Travel advisors play a critical role in, the, in working with clients to plan travel for business and leisure purposes. Today, the entire travel industry comprises tens of thousands of travel advisors who are running their own businesses. The majority of them work from home and are literally building their business in their neighborhoods, backyards, and in their communities. At Dream Vacations, we support thousands of small business owners around the country who took a chance and had a dream to start a business and create something that was their own. Some have been doing it for more than 30 years and believe it or not, quite a few started their business in the midst of the pandemic. All travel advisors earn a living based on what they sell their customers and they get paid when their customers actually travel. One tourism sector that is especially important to travel advisors is the cruise industry. 78% of all cruise vacations are booked by a travel advisor in the industry and cruise accounts for a large portion of their business. More than 70% of the cruise bookings made today are set to depart in 2022 or later, which means these businesses will not get paid largely for another year. 
Despite industry leading protocols and proven sailings in other regions of the world, it has been almost 16 months since cruise ships departed from US ports, ultimately impacting the livelihood of tens of thousands small business owners during that time. Cruise is the only travel and tourism sector in the United States still shut down. Thank you so much for your support in the passage last week of the Alaska Tourism Restoration Act, and we were thrilled to see yesterday's signing of the bill by President Biden. Alaska is a critical cruise market, not just in terms of cruise bookings, but also the jobs supported by the cruise passengers that visit the state. My written testimony outlines the devastating impact of the travel industry, but here are a few statistics specifically. The reduction in travel caused by COVID-19 resulted in a $500 billion loss in travel spending across the United States in 2020. With 5.6 million travel supported jobs lost, accounting for 65% of all jobs lost in the country. For the cruise industry, it represents 39 billion in total economic losses, including the loss of 300,000 jobs, along with 16.5 billion in wages. We've seen a number of our travel advisors shift gears and do their best to make a living during this downturn. Specifically in Florida, one of our top franchisees who's been in business for 30 years, we had to go back and become a school nurse, and another went and got a job at a local grocery store. In Nevada, one resorted to becoming an Uber driver and to, and to be delivering Uber Eats just to put food on the table. In Washington State, we had several franchises partner with local businesses in their communities to do virtual wine tasting events just so they could maintain relevance in their customers' mindset while they couldn't travel. Congress can help the travel and tourism sector recover by enacting policies to spur travel demand and support workers who are not yet fully participating in our country's economic recovery. We're so grateful for the strong economic support provided by the CARES Act and subsequent relief packages approved by Congress. Relief packages like the Paycheck Protection Program provided much needed lifelines to many of these small businesses and workers in the travel and tourism sector. Every week, my team and I have individual conversations with small business owners and the stories that we hear are truly heartbreaking as families' livelihoods are on the line. Because travel agents do not earn an income until their customer travels, we anticipate that many travel advisors could suffer financial hardship for the next year as they continue to book in, in the future. With the Paycheck Protection Program set to expire in May, I ask that you consider extending targeted relief programs for sectors that will take longer to recover. Finally, the return of cruising out of the U.S. is a vital step. The biggest hurdle now for the continued success of our travel advisors is for cruising and all forms of travel to come back full throttle. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the entire travel advisor community your efforts to support the rebuild and recovery for travel and tourism and the many small businesses that are critical to the sector are greatly appreciated. I promise travel advisors are certainly going to play a key role in helping get Americans traveling again and boosting economic recovery across the entire country. We need to ensure that these businesses and their workers can survive the remaining challenges pre presented by the pandemic overall. Um, but thank you and I look forward to hearing your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Daly. And again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for joining today and for their thoughtful opening statements. So I'm going to start it off with a question to Mr. Newsom about small businesses and then move on to Mr. Taylor to talk a little bit about our hospitality workforce. So over the past year, Nevada's small businesses, particularly the businesses who depend on our tourism and hospitality industry for their customers, of course, we know they've struggled to keep their doors open due to COVID-19. In response, Congress passed numerous small business support programs, Paycheck Protection Program, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, those help small businesses stay afloat and keep their workers on the payroll. Unfortunately, PPP ran out of funds on May 4th, and just yesterday, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund stopped taking new applications. With hospitality and tourism being slower to recover than other industries, additional Limited targeted relief may be needed until business and leisure travelers in both the U.S. and abroad have the confidence to travel once again. So, Mr. Newsom, as the tourism and hospitality industry slowly recovers from the economic impacts of this public health crisis, what additional support uh, do you think Congress could provide to our small businesses, and what investments do you think we might make more broadly going forward? Uh, we want a healthy recovery, and we want a robust one, and uh, we want to support everything that you're working on. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Rosen. Uh, one of the things that I think is real important is um, continuing to provide access to capital to uh, small and minority businesses. As we know, um, systemically, that has been a challenge, especially for most of our minority owned firms. Um, we, we, we found that even prior to the pandemic, it was very, very difficult to get access to capital, um, opening up um, CDFIs and opening up uh, alternative lending resources have been very beneficial to uh, to small businesses. The other thing is uh, broadband. As you know, in, in Nevada, we have a lot of rural uh, businesses, and and really, um, you know, they they have a challenge with some of these Zoom calls and and different um, opportunities to do business online. So I think that's extremely important. And and one of the thing, the other thing that I mentioned um, was childcare. I know that a lot of my you know my employees and and people who are members of the chamber. Um, they, they were not only challenged with going back to work, uh, a lot of the employees were not just challenged with um, any funding from a, uh, from a, uh, a package or, or, or from, a, from a unemployment, but a lot of them were struggling with child care right. and, and what did they do with their children to keep them safe. So um, I, I would say that those are, uh, those are one of the crucial, but for, in particular for small business owners, continue to fund the small business development centers continue to fund the uh, resources that help uh, small businesses to small business owners to become better operators of their business. I was fortunate to, to spend time in the military. I was fortunate and blessed to work in gaming and hospitality. And I learned a lot from those industries. Um, not everybody has that opportunity. So I think that is a, that is a great opportunity there. And then the, the last thing that I say is real important is, is the, is the health Healthcare costs. It is really important that we help small businesses um, have an opportunity um, to provide uh, affordable um, health care for their for their uh, employees, as well as um, you know try to defray the costs and make sure that we're not spending all of our money on on health care where we should be providing most of the uh, the money to our employees and helping uh, to provide better services to uh, to our clients and our and our um, and our customers. So. I think what's important is don't forget um, small businesses. The small businesses are the backbone of this country. We, we bring people back to work faster. Um, we do a lot, so we do appreciate what has happened, but there's a lot more to be done. Thank you. Well, that's a good segue. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Taylor, because uh, earlier this year, we American Rescue Plan uh, covered uh, Senator Cortez Masto and I worked diligently to be sure that 100% of COBRA insurance was covered during the pandemic. People lost their job through no fault of their own, and uh, we really secured that. We know how important it was to our culinary workers union, to all the union members, and just workers across this country. So just a few seconds um, I have left. We'll go into a second round, of course. Can you talk about the impact that fully subsidized COBRA health benefits had on your members in the hospitality and tourism industry? Uh, uh Yes, Senator Rosen, I think that that's one of the keystones of what has helped people survive. The 100% COBRA subsidy is going to allow members to get back on health insurance in our industry. In the uh, Basically, a lot in the hospitality industry, only 23% of employers continue to provide health care benefits. So in the middle of a health care pandemic, we had people losing health care. So this has been a huge plus under the American Rescue Plan. We're enrolling people now. It's for six months. And bluntly, if I was looking ahead about what Congress can do, is even if people start returning to work, they often have to requalify for health care. Continuing the COBRA for a while, I think it helps both small and large business right now because I, I don't want to use the word ironic. Were tracked right when we were shut down, right in the middle of the healthcare pandemic. We had people losing healthcare. That seems counterintuitive to just basic reason. Uh, I, I can't think of anything more impactful uh, that came under the American Rescue Plan than the 100% COBRA subsidy. Well, thank you, Mr. Taylor. Senator Cortez Masto and I were glad to work on that. So, Senator Scott, you're recognized. Great. Thank you, Chair Rosen. Um, so, Mr. Looper, can you talk about, um, we've heard, I think, 
uh, from uh, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Newsom, some of the challenges that they've had uh, with labor shortages. Can you talk about some of the issues that that your industry's had with labor shortages? Uh, yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, labor shortages is, is not an issue that's new to us in Florida. Um, the, the tourism industry has grown tremendously uh, as population has grown, but a lot of the population growth we've seen in Florida is, is uh, retirees. Um, I think it's interesting, um, Senator, that when you were the governor, you, um, you doubled, uh, you, you uh, increased tourism promotion funding by 50%, and we ended up netting a 50% increase in visitation to the state of Florida. So uh, and certainly the, the economics of continuing to drive uh, visitors to the Sunshine State uh, has put uh, even more strain on, on the labor market. Um, it, it also has, has affected uh, wages. Uh, you know, the, the minimum wage is not something that is, uh, is even talked about anymore. Uh, Florida's uh, employers are paying significantly more than the minimum wage. Um, one of the things that's particularly interesting is the fact that teens are less and less inclined to participate in uh, summer jobs. And, you know, traditionally in America, summertime was a time when you go back and, and get the job and earn a few bucks and, and learn some skills and, and accept some responsibility. But there's some uh, interesting uh, statistics from the uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics that, that demonstrate that less and less teens are participating in the labor force. Um, another thing that's affecting us right now is the uh, inability for uh, the Department of State to provide visas for the uh, summer uh, workforce program. And uh, typically there's about 100,000 uh, international students that come into the United States to participate in uh, learning more about America, our economy, and our culture while working during the summertime. And unfortunately, this year, that number is, is uh, only about 5% of that, or about 5,000. So there's a lot of things contributing to that. It's not necessarily a new issue. It's not necessarily an issue with, um, with the COVID and with the pandemic, but it's, it's, it's really a, a sea change in, in America and the population and, and what, uh, what types of futures people are looking for. I think our industry, the tourism and travel industry, needs to do a better job demonstrating uh, and telling our story on why, why particularly entry-level jobs in tourism and travel are so important. And in fact, uh, statistics from U.S. Travel Association demonstrate that people whose first job is in tourism will, by age 50, end up uh, earning more per year than those who started their their careers in in healthcare or manufacturing or other industries in Florida. So it's a great entry level opportunity, and I think the best opportunity we have is to get more uh, young people excited and interested in the the futures of, in the hospitality industry. Thank you, Mr. Looper. Uh, Mr. Daly, can you talk about how many jobs you estimate rely on the cruising industry, uh, directly and indirectly, in the United States and in Florida? and what your, your estimated timeline is for all those jobs to return, and do you believe they will return? So thank you for the question, great question. So yes, I do think as we're seeing, uh, re, re, uh, the, we have signs coming up right now of the rebuild and recovery. Of course, I mentioned with the recent announcements towards Alaska, about 300,000 jobs were impacted in 2020 from the industry due to the pandemic. I do believe based on what we're seeing, you know, obviously the goal is a return to normal and what that looks like. I can say that in 2022 then and in the future, the demand for cruising and the response to it from consumers for that and from the local advisors and their communities, it's been, it's never been greater. So it's gonna be a thunderous return. And ultimately that with that will come back the jobs. And of course, and it impacts more than just the jobs within the cruise industry per se, but it's the ancillary industries as well that affect hospitality and all the local areas and cities where cruises sail from around the United States and as well into um, other markets too. Thanks, Mr. Daly. Do you believe that the um, both um, customers, uh, passengers and uh, workers can come back to the cruise industry and operate safely? Without a doubt. I mean, what the safety and safety, first of all, health and safety protocols have never been more important to the cruise industry. They always have been. And I think the enhancements that they've had over the past 16 months, understanding the science, what we've been seeing in our own backyards. I mean, now people used to show pictures of 
when someone's traveling of eating a meal, now they're showing pictures of someone cleaning a seat at an airport or in a hotel. And ultimately, I think what we're seeing and what we will see is the safety protocols, the healthy sail panels that the cruise lines partnered with the Cruise Line International Association to ensure they were working with the experts, working with science, finding the right solution so they can safely return to service with social distancing protocols and, of course, with the recent vaccinations and the, uh, the rollout of the vaccination successfully around the United States, that's going to be a significant factor in the safe return to cruising. Great. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Thank you, Chair Rosen. Well, thank you, Mr. Daly. Senator Klobuchar is here. We're going to give her a moment uh, to get into her seat, and then she will uh, ask the next question question. Uh, we've, uh, she's been kind enough to join us here in person, even though so much of our uh, hearings have been remote because of COVID. So we're happy to see her here. Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you uh, very much, Chairwoman, and for your great work in Nevada and across the country when it comes to tourism, as well as uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Scott. Um, I know that uh, last week you had a hearing on international tourism. Um, and a really, really important topic. Senator Blunt and I lead the uh, Brand USA reauthorization. And I guess I'd start with that, uh, with you, uh, Mr. Lufer, and your testimony. You emphasize the importance of that when it comes to international travel. Um, and uh, one recent report found that if international travel does not begin to reopen soon, the U.S. is projected to lose $175 billion in spending by the end of 2021. Uh, can you talk about the importance of the role of Brand USA um, um, in the past and what we need to do going forward? Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, yes, uh, you know, if you think about tourism marketing, there's there's kind of three buckets. There's your local level, which is the county, your state level, and the national level. And for, for a long time, the United States was without a travel uh, tourism marketing office. And at this point, our attraction members, even the smallest members, are, are able to participate in international marketing because of the leveraging that is permitted by working with your county, who's then working with your state office, that's then working with your with, with our national office at Brand USA, uh, to take those dollars collectively and to spread the good news of the destinations that America has to offer. The United States is an incredible country, and our, our history and our culture and our natural resources are unlike anything else in the world, even though we're a relatively small country. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the international travelers we have at Florida uh, and what interests them and what excites them are things that locals kind of take for granted. Uh, you know, show them an alligator and, and their day is made. <laughs> uh, show me an alligator and it's roadkill. So what attracts internationals is so different. And what uh, Chris Thompson and his team at Brand USA are able to offer is uh, an incredible opportunity for all members of the United States tourism and travel um, uh, community to participate in sharing the story of America with people thank around you. the world. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, we may not have alligators in Minnesota. We do have walleye. Uh, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to um, um, my good friend, Mr. Taylor, or as I know him, D. How are you, Mr. Taylor? Senator, thank you. Okay, good. I wanted to ask you about business travel uh, because uh, the hotel industry is expected to be down uh, 500,000 jobs by the end of 2021, partly due to uh, predicted permanent changes in business travel. So even as we get out of this pandemic, there's going to be this even longer transition when it comes to uh, business travel. Could you talk about that problem? Um, and I think one report found that half of U.S. hotel rooms are projected to remain empty in 2021. That's about 180,000 jobs. What more should we do when it comes to business travel um, and resolving this problem? Uh, I appreciate the question. I think a few things. One, um, I think tax incentives for uh, conventions and or uh, business travel should be temporarily looked at because uh, in the kind of big hotels in the cities, uh, that they rely heavily on business travel. 
And without that, I think that uh, those job protections are actually are, are rosy as compared to bleak. Second is uh, we are worried about a jobless recovery in certain cases with the hotel industry because they've made it very clear on their earnings calls, et cetera, about not doing certain things that we've always assumed staying in a hotel, like have, having your room cleaned by a housekeeper, being part of the thing that is enjoyable uh, and actually uh, charging for that. So that's an issue. And the final thing is this. Um, I think without any question, uh, if you look at almost every major metropolitan area, the first, second, third largest industry is a tourism industry. I think we have to figure out how we view those jobs is just as important as manufacturing jobs, just as uh, important as retail jobs. No one very often talks about hospitality jobs or tourism jobs. It's easy to do that in Florida or Nevada, but even in, let's say, Minneapolis, St. Paul, tourism is a huge part of that downtown area why people come to, et cetera. So I think we have to change our dialogue on that and we have to do promotions like that and incentives like that, like we do in other industries. Very good. Um, uh, Mr. Newsom, you wanna add anything to that? Thank you, thank you, Senator. Um, I, you know, I think that um, uh, Dee is right on, on point when it comes to uh, how, how we uh, view things. And one of the things that I think is real important is the unprecedented partnerships that we uh, have done have 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 created through these uh, these tough times. I think that um, it, it, you know they say uh, um, you know adversity creates strange bedfellows, but I think in this case, strange bedfellows means that all of the all of the organizations um, come together and and work together to uh, um, to help with uh, tourism and help with um, and, and and thinking th thinking through things in a whole different way. I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. That's the beauty of small business is that we we think outside of a box. And in some cases, we don't have a box because we're focused on trying to solve a problem. So I think that um, D is right on, on point with, with his comments. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, now joining us via WebEx, uh, Senator Blackburn. Thank you so much, Madam Chairman, and thank you for continuing to work on this. Um, when you talk about <clears throat> tourism, of course, Memphis, Nashville, East Tennessee with the Great Smoky Mountains, which is the most visited park in our federal park system, uh, we have been really hit by this. And as I talk to leaders in the industry, whether it is the tour industry, whether it is uh, the motor coach industry, whether it is uh, at some of the small businesses in Gatlinburg or the support crew for concerts. And uh, what I'm hearing is labor shortage. And what I am hearing is the increase in federal unemployment benefits is having a significant adverse impact on our labor pool. And it's why our governor in Tennessee is ending the end of next month, ending the plus up in unemployment. So Mr. Lufer, am I saying your name right first? Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay, uh, talk to me a little bit. I know Miami, Orlando, they're very similar in that tourist makeup for uh, the way Nashville and uh, the Smoky Mountains area is. Talk to me about how, as the live event industry tries to recover, how are these cities that are event-centric, like Orlando, like uh, Nashville, going to be able to handle these labor pressures? And I appreciate that you mentioned the summer worker program that the Department of State has had. That has impacted us also. So give me just a minute on that issue. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yeah, the, the, the event industry and meetings and, and conventions is probably one of the, the, the two weak links for our recovery in Florida is the meetings and convention business. And the second would be international travel. Uh, and the fact that Florida was only down 14% in the first quarter over last year indicates that we've really had a strong domestic recovery already. 
But the labor shortage is a real problem. The, uh, the federal uh, program in Florida has also been uh, eliminated at the end of next month. Uh, that will help. But the, the labor shortage is, is, is something that predates the, the pandemic. And, and there is, um, I, th I think one of the messages is there's great career opportunities and we need to do a better job uh, working with colleges and universities and high schools in careers, uh, career tracks in the hospitality and tourism industry. It's a great industry. It's an entrepreneurial industry. It's an industry where you, you gain great responsibility and uh, it's it's an area where we need to do a better job bringing, bringing more people in to want to be a part of our industry. Well, in last week's hearing, I mentioned that CDC, DHS, DOT need to come together on guidance to open up international travel. I know Mr. Daly would like to see that happen. And um, I appreciated in your comments, you said that guidance from CDC, DOT and OSHA would be, can be viewed as conflicting. I talk a little bit about why it is imperative that these federal agencies get on the same, same page so we can get this travel opened up. You know, we have CMA week that usually takes place that first week of June there in Nashville, and it is a big international destination. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, the, the specific conflicts uh, I was speaking to were um, were protocols dealing with the virus. Um, and and the CDC comes out periodically and, and updates this, this chart, and, and it's really what the news media uses to communicate um, where we are and what's what's safe, what's not safe, and levels of safety, and 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 the inconsistency between the messaging for the CDC and what the Department of Transportation says, and finally how OSHA apparently is is chasing what the CDC is doing, trying to keep up but unable to, um, and, and on their website basically they just punt and say don't look here, look there. Um, but, but these federal agencies, they need to be in one accord. And if we're going to communicate how to stay safe, let's all be on the same page. I could not agree more. Uh, Mr. Newsom, uh, appreciated your testimony about small businesses that contract to the hotels. Because in Nashville, we have a lot of people that provide swag for concerts. And some of them will tell you the concert business is 50 60 percent of their business for the year so when that shut down they lost most of their revenues is that what you're seeing in nevada yes absolutely thank you senator for that question you know one of the things that happens is we forget about the hairstylists we forget about the people who are the wardrobe specialists we forget about uh, some of the small businesses that provide microphones and different things like that. Everybody is impacted from top to bottom when when uh, when the industry shuts down and when entertainment goes away. And I'm happy to say that this week we were talking about entertainment coming live entertainment coming back to Las Vegas because yeah. now yeah. that just creates so many opportunities and so many jobs. So yes, it absolutely did impact um, a lot of jobs and a lot of small businesses. Yeah, yeah. I think that those guys that are the Griffs and the gappers and the stylists and they're hauling that equipment. They're that entire ecosystem of the live event industry. They do the t-shirts, they do the hats, they man the, the booths. And uh, I'm with you. Let's get this money back to those small businesses and let's help them get back on their feet. We appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, thank you, Senator Blackburn. And uh, I'd like to open it to another round of questioning for us from Senator Scott. Thank you, Chair Rosen. Um, so, Mr. Taylor, can you talk about how you, for the individuals that have been able to go back, how you've been able to, to help your employers create a safe environment, work environment? And I'm, I'm sure it's difficult, and they're all different, but I'm sure it's been difficult. How have you been able to do that? Yeah, uh, let me un unmute it. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, the, the nuance of, of health and safety, I did not meet a company in our industry that did not have huge protocols on health and safety about people going back to work. Obviously, as everybody knows, when the rubber meets the road, it's a little bit different. 
Um, and I think it varied. I think certain companies took it quite seriously. And uh, because as I said, and I'm sure you understand, the quickest way to get people back into our industry to come back is to feel safe. Um, and what we found, for example, I know the work I did in Las Vegas around this issue is we had to explain to everybody, you can't just be safe in one uh, casino or one hotel. The virus doesn't stop. You can't just look at the workers. You have to also look at the customers. Uh, that obviously the same message went throughout. Uh, I think the best way to get people back uh, at every level is for the companies to do the kind of stuff on health and safety. And candidly, uh, I think one of the ways to do that is either uh, incentivize folks to get vaccinated. And if those don't, those workers do not want to get vaccinated to have very, very regular COVID testing because anybody wants to feel safe. And I, and I think that's a, just a fundamental thing. I think, as I said earlier, I think Disney was exemplary in your state, for example. Uh, I think there have been some exemplary companies about this. Uh, and unfortunately, there have been some who are not. And unfortunately, those who are not, I think jeopardize everybody else. So I think more and more that we can have a, uh, a level playing field of health and safety the better off we will be because at the end of the day, the hospitality in relies on two things. One, one people have to have income in order to go places, but also to have the, the security and feeling of safety. Um, and then, you know, finally uh, is not view the workers as a cost item, but view them as a service product that brings back loyalty, et cetera, which I know everybody speaking on this call understands very well. Sometimes we have companies that understand that very well and some do not at all. So I appreciate the question, Senator Scott. Thanks, Mr. Taylor, and thanks for what you do. Um, Mr. Lupfer, do, do you believe uh, over the next 12 months, you, the, your, the industry you work with is all gonna come back and we'll have all the jobs back that, that we lost during the pandemic? I wish we could get all the, the workers back, actually. Uh, that's kind of our, our problem right now. But um, here's here's a little bit of, of, of good news, at least for the folks here in Florida. Um, our, our spring break Easter season was extraordinary, uh, exceeded expectations. Uh, we, we really kind of got caught not anticipating what was going to happen. And speaking of small business, we had three privately owned mom and pop attractions that experienced one day all time attendance records uh, in April of this year. And what we're seeing now for the summer uh, is a tremendous demand on, on Florida coast to coast to coast um, with, with pre bookings. Uh, this is going to be an exceptional summer season. Uh, really the only thing holding us back is, is going to be labor. But I think a year from now, if COVID continues the decline, and if uh, if if there's there's not any uh, any any additional uh, big outbreaks, uh, and as the world comes back out of this, uh, Florida and the United States is going to be in a great place a year from now. Thank you, thank you, Chair Rosen. Thank you, Senator Scott. I have a, a couple more questions I'd like to ask, and so um, there's been a lot of discussion today about our economy being in full recovery. So I wanna talk about some of the hardest hit states during this economic crisis and where we stand today. I'm really pleased to hear that Florida is coming back and that some of those businesses have had record attendance and I'm sure that will continue and I, I hope for that. But overall, this recovery has been uneven. The Bureau of Labor Statistics released state by state April unemployment numbers just this past Friday. So according to BLS, 21 states still have an unemployment rate of 6% or higher, and six states, including Nevada, are still at 8% or higher. Hawaii, which is like Nevada, depends on travel and tourism for its economy, is actually the highest at 8.5%. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a dozen states with employment rates under 4%. Uh, that's where Nevada was, under 3% when the COVID crisis hit, but of course we're not back there yet. So given how the recovery does look different in different parts of the country, it makes sense that it looks different to various senators depending on where their states are, uh, various governors, 
as well. So for my state, which relies heavily on tourism and our small businesses that support it, um, we still do need that help. And last week in the subcommittee, we talked about how each of our states has so much that's unique and it's beautiful to offer to tourists and visitors. And likewise, each of our state is unique in its public health and economic uh, impact of COVID-19. So it's important to remember, while we're all impacted by the pandemic, uh, pandemic-related benefits um, that may not be needed in some parts of the country may still be needed in others as we begin to all recover together, because we have to get everybody on the other side of this crisis. So uh, Mr. Taylor, with that in mind, um, I want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, based on your experience and, of course, all of your conversations, number one, how excited uh, are your members to get back to work? And number two, what has the, un the federal unemployment meant to those hospitality workers when we're still only, as I think you stated, 50% uh, back in Las Vegas and so um, not robustly back yet? Yeah, I'm... Uh I'm somewhat at a loss when I hear people don't want to go back to work. I, I know when I talk to our folks, there's nothing more they want to do but to go back to work. Um, they don't view this as a temporary job. This is their profession, and they have a lot of pride in that. And I think, uh, candidly, the standard we've raised in Las Vegas has allowed that where people can actually buy a home and have what we call the American dream. Um, so I, I think that's important, you know, as... Um, Federal unemployment has been a lifesaver, uh, and it's been a lifesaver because no one gets rich on unemployment. Um, uh, the extension of unemployment increase, I think, even I think the Reserve Bank of Philadelphia said, has been a huge uh, prevention of, frankly, homelessness. Uh, even though, as we know, in many major cities, that's a problem. It has helped tremendously on that. And uh, bluntly, the what y'all did uh, on in the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan on food insecurity. I never thought in this country I would see the kind of food banks that I have seen. Uh, but I know in Nevada, uh, as you know, Senator, the Culinary Training Academy has been having a food bank uh, four days a week since March of last year. They've distributed over 14 tons of food. Um, and frankly, that keeps on going. Um, we have, when I hear unemployment at 8%, I have no idea where they get that number because, uh, as you know, in the hospitality industry, whether it be restaurants, hotels, casinos, concert venues, et cetera, those are not back, even in the most optimistic sense. And those people are without jobs. So the unemployment and also uh, the money for food and, frankly, the eviction moratorium has been key. So uh, I can't thank you enough, but nobody wants any of that stuff. They want to go back to work. People have pride. They, they want to work with their hands. They want to meet their customers. They want to see the loyal people come back. Um, so that's a frustrating thing. At the same time, uh, you could open up every place in the world. If people don't feel safe, they're not going to come back. And I agree on the international travel. We've got to try to get international travel moving again. I know uh, Mr. Lufer is exactly right. America is an unbelievable country. You can see the greatest things in the world here, and uh, we want them to come here. But obviously, part of that has to do with safety, and I, I appreciate all the work that you all have done on all of that, too. Thank you. I want to uh, just ask one final question, and um, it's really to, it's to Mr. Newsom. You know, our pandemics... Um, really had an impact on our workers of color, our small business owners. Um, it's disproportionately impacted certain racial and ethnic groups whose employment is concentrated in hospitality and leisure. During the Great Recession that began in 28, uh, 2008, excuse me, Latinos experienced some of the highest levels of unemployment because they were heavily concentrated in hospitality and construction jobs, two sectors that experienced steep downturns. As of 2018, the year for when the most recent data is available, 32% of Latinos, about 34% of Asians, which were employed in leisure and hospitality, um, they suggest that workers in these two groups are at higher risk 
for unemployment during economic downturns because of what happens in these sectors. Immigrant workers, what we've talked about, they've been tr traditionally been mainstays for many of these occupations, have also been disproportionately impacted. So as you are chair of the Urban Chamber, uh, Mr. Newsom, how are minority-owned businesses working to ensure that workers of color in the hospitality and tourism industry are not left behind and um, just in, in, you talked about it a little bit, um, specific things that we may do in some of those communities to be sure that we keep um, our small businesses growing every which way we can. Well, thank you very much for that, um, Senator Rosen. And as you know, you know, in 2008, I was grossly impacted um, by losing 60% of my business, which, you know, we spend a lot of time working with construction firms and, and working with uh, in the hospitality industry. And one of the things that's real important is that, you know, we have to uh, stay, keep investing, keep investing in, in the workforce, keep investing in tourism. But like I said, really investing in the Jobs Act because building the infrastructure is really what helped uh, Nevada make a turn for, for the better when it came to small and minority firms and when it came to uh, rebuilding our economy, because as you, you know, we, we, we passed the fuel tax, we, pat, we, had, we built a stadium, we built a new convention center, those things brought back jobs. But not, not only that, our Nevada State Legislature in their wisdom um, put in, in the law that 15% of those contracts would go to small businesses. That was huge because with a focus on that, it really brought back a lot of the workforce. It brought people back, you know, back from uh, where they, they they wanted to work. And, and I agree with Dee that people don't want to sit at home. People are not trying to figure out how they can just lay back and relax on, on, on the small amount of support that they receive. They really want to be out there working. They want to work hard. And as you know, uh, Sen Senator Rosen, the Urban Chamber, Latin Chamber and Asian Chamber in support with our with our Vegas chamber and the Henderson chamber, these these guys all work together. I, I tell you what I love about being a Nevadan is the fact that everybody comes close. Like I said, we're a very, very close com community, north and south. Most people try to divide us, but as a Nevada community, we are all in the same boat and we, we typically uh, come together to make sure that if the least of us suffers, we make sure that we all chip in. So our minority communities um, can rebound with the support of, of these investments and, and, and some of the um, innovation that we're talking about. Plus, it also helps to build our, uh, our infrastructure. It also helps us to build our community. And then everybody, everybody working is, 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 is really what the goal is in getting everybody um, back to uh, recover together. And I call it more than recovery, I call it rebounding because I think rebounding means you're bouncing back. Recovery is you're going back to where you were. I think we need to go better and harder and stronger than where we were before. I like that, we're gonna rebound. Senator Scott, do you have anything else? Otherwise, I'm gonna close out the hearing. So I really wanna thank um, all of our witnesses for being here today, for um, your work, for your passion, for your care, for your states, for your communities, and everything that you do. It's so important, and we will all rebound together. So I really appreciate you all. So for the record, this hearing record will remain open for two weeks until Tuesday, June 8th, 2021. Any senators that would like to submit questions for the record should do so by Tuesday, June 8th, 2021. For those of you who testified today, we ask that your responses be returned to the committee as quickly as possible, and in no case later than two weeks after receipt. That concludes today's hearing. I thank you.